As society advances, we become less connected with our natural world. And it wasn't until this whole pandemic broke out that I realized as well that I'm so dependent on the system, groceries, uh, going to dinner, which obviously we couldn't do anymore, but just getting the groceries and all of a sudden not having any alternative or knowing of any alternative. And I just felt panicky like everyone else. I'm like, okay, well, what do I do? Like, how do I feed my family? So it kind of inspired and pushed me to learn more about edible plants in the wild. Properly identifying which plants you can eat is actually a lot harder than it looks. A mistake in the wild can mean the difference between a satisfying meal or stomach ache for hours or as I've said before even death. So I wanted to learn as much as I could about all the edible plants starting with the most common and easiest to identify which includes of course berries, raspberries, strawberries and blackberries. My, f my favorite kind of foraging, the super easy kind, raspberries. This one's a tiny little thing. I don't know how many people, if you're walking, if you ever see this and you're like, oh, I don't really know if they're raspberries, it's pretty easy to tell. They look like raspberries, chances are they are. I don't see any more in here though. Oh, there's some more back in the bush there, but I'm not going through there. What's nice about uh, raspberries, oh, I think there's more over here. What's nice about raspberries is, the uh, leaves on the raspberry actually are used during, no, before, during, and after childbirth to reduce the chances of miscarriage, reduce labor pains, and to increase milk flow uh, for mothers. And I had no idea that that, I don't know why nobody ever does that anymore. Maybe it's not proven. A lot of these plants, they're always like, oh, we're used for this and used for that. I don't know how effective they were. All we know is that they were used usually by uh, indigenous people and stuff like that, and that's how we know about this stuff. Well, this isn't raspberries, these are uh, blackberries. Yeah, these are blackberries. It's a little sweet. Big difference between blackberries and raspberries. Again, completely safe to eat. Good for high sugar, instant energy. Uh, difference is that when you pull the raspberry off, it's got the hollow center, you know, when you buy them in the store. And blackberries, it has that solid core, which I'm not terribly fond of. But you can make jellies, jams, all sorts of stuff with this. Very, very sweet, very high in sugar. I'm not sure about the leaves of the blackberry. I'm assuming, since it's around the same family, that they're probably similar medicinal uh, uses, you know, for the childbirth stuff. But raspberries, I think, actually have a bit of a better flavor. I love coming across this stuff, though, because it's easy treats. Some plants, particularly weeds, which are all around us, are seen as a pest. We try and get them out of our gardens all the time, but historically, for more years in human history than recent years, they've helped us stay alive and healthy. Look at all these big things. Milkweed, big clusters, usually they have a Ton, oh yeah, I was gonna say a ton of bugs on them. A lot of aphids and all sorts of stuff. So this actually has uh, two uses, edible. The young shoots, like on the ground, and flowers are actually edible, but you gotta boil them first. The other treatment is if, if we get the leaves and everything, oh, even that, like, it's just dripping. It's just dripping out of there. You can take a look at that. This is the milk, the, the sap from it. This actually is used as a topical uh, agent for cuts, abrasions, bruises, and stuff like that, or lacerations, not bruises. I don't know how it would treat bruises. But anyway, it's used to treat that. Now the problem is that this milky sap stuff, while it can be used as a topical agent, and while there are components of this that are edible, this is actually quite toxic and can cause heart failure if, if you have heart problems. So not recommended to, to just eat. Don't go out there and start eating this stuff. While it can be used to treat stuff, and it is actually quite sticky, um, 
but you don't want to eat this and that's why it's got to be boiled if you're going to eat the shoots and the uh, flowers you have to boil them i don't imagine it's going to taste that great but you know you can and i don't know how to identify the problem is as an amateur most of these plants if this was a shoot which is they're saying like the the juvenile shoots are edible if it was like that i don't know if i'd be able to identify it it would have to be on like on my property and i'd have to know where they are so i know what's actually growing there because honestly unless there's a flower on this stuff as an amateur i can't identify half the stuff until this stuff grows like this stuff is pretty obvious what it is at this point but uh quite difficult and since this can potentially cause heart problems i've got heart problems i would never even try and eat this stuff no thanks no nope. Long-term survivability in the wild greatly increases when you have a way to combat illness and infection. You could have a full belly every day, food all over the place, and you get a simple cut on your leg, next thing you know it's infected and you're in big trouble. It's crazy to think that the smallest cut, laceration, or lesion could end up killing you even if you had all the food in the world. So learning about plants like Joe Pie Weed, which has been used for hundreds of years by Native Americans, is critical to your long-term survivability. Looks like we found some jopa weed. All this stuff here, this stuff, the roots, other than the typical medicinal stuff, which is, you know, made a tonic where it treats coughs and colds and stuff, which is typical. The roots used to be roasted and pulverized or whatever they did, I guess the ash or something like that. Although I don't know how ash would taste, but they would use it as a substitute for salt on food as uh, flavoring probably the same way we would use herbs and stuff like that because salts you know on a thing all on its own the problem with these tonics is that while cold it treats it, it can in, uh, improve digestion and make your increase your appetite but if you have it hot it will actually make you vomit <laughs> so generally I would avoid this but you know if you wanted to try the the roots I'm sure there's someone out there that has made a recipe on that but you know I'm not, the vomit part has me not wanting to try that at all. In the beginning when I was first trying to learn about all these plants, it was actually quite difficult to distinguish between the safe one and the not so safe one. Unfortunately, almost every single plant we came across had an evil twin. So even though you're like, oh, that's this, and you're like, wait, or is it this? Or maybe it's this. And that uncertainty, the, the, even if it was just 5%, causes you not to trust yourself. And until you have enough experience, that doubt constantly creeps in. But that doubt is what keeps you alive. these wild carrots you know the funny the funniest thing is trying to learn what what is edible and what's not we were out here and by we I mean my son Liam who's the camera person um, we, we were trying to find wild carrot and they're like listen it looks very similar to this it looks similar to yarrow it looks similar to these other ones you got to make sure it's not poisonous and we're like oh, okay well, we're looking for it we're walking by fields of this all the time and then we actually find out that the wild carrot is Queen Anne's lace. As known in North America, it's this stuff. It's literally everywhere. It's on the side of ditches and everything. Now, the edible part, obviously a carrot grows uh, in the earth. You're supposed to be able to, it's the tap root down in here. I don't know if I'm even gonna be able to get that out. Okay, well, it, it looked more like a parsnip. And this thing is uh, a tiny thing. In the fall, these things will actually be a lot better. And you can't eat the second year ones. Well, you can, it's still edible, but they have a tough center root that you actually have to pull out. It's, it would be like chewing on a stick. So when you're, when you're cutting it like this, is feeling very woody. You don't want to eat this. And the reason why you want to eat in the fall is, as the plant is dying, all of the nutrients, everything that it's doing to survive for the next year is being forced down into that tap root. So it gets filled with sugars, it gets a little more plump, but what you're supposed to look for is the first year. Again, I'm glad that I can identify this as wild carrot. So if need be, I know I can eat this horrible embarrassment of a root that I pulled up. But 
you know, I wouldn't know. If it was really uh, small, I don't know the difference between a, a first year and a second year. This is sort of skills that you gotta continue to acquire if you're gonna do foraging. But at the very minimal, at least I know now that this is actually wild carrot and it was just, it's just everywhere. So yeah, uh, don't mistake this for, for Yarrow though. I've seen on TV, they showed actually, uh, not TV, but you know, the internet. I've seen big plump ones. So they do get a lot bigger and these fields are just, just everywhere. I just thought it was kind of funny. I'm like, ah, we just can't seem to find it. You know, walking through this stuff every single time we're here. Once I feel comfortable enough properly identifying as many edible plants as possible and fungi, I'd like to actually use them in a practical manner. Go out and see if I can forage enough food in a day for the normal daily caloric intake that I need. I'd like to see if I could actually do that and I'd actually like to use them. I make teas, uh, make them into a salad, cook them, whatever the case may be. But right now, because I'm so new, it's just not something I'm comfortable doing yet. I also have a lot more learning to do. I've only learned to identify plants in the summer. And that's usually the easiest because the berries are there, you know, the, the mushrooms are growing everywhere. It's very easy to identify. But as for fall and especially winter, as it stands right now, I would basically starve to death because I have no idea how to find anything edible. I don't know how to preserve anything. I don't know what you can preserve from the summertime in the wild. So I have a lot of learning to do. So once I feel comfortable identifying enough plants and I've got some experience in all four seasons, I'm gonna make some more videos and hopefully you guys join me for those as well because that should be interesting. Either it's gonna go really well or you're gonna be seeing me throwing up and having the scoots for a whole season.